we are here and it's so good. So my presentation is about epidemiological problem. The topic presented here on the first slide. So actually I've got all the chief nurses of surgical uh, departments as my co-authors. I, I'll skip all the information from epidemiology I know, but I'll give you a short glimpse. It's a research center that is situated in a very picturesque place of St. Petersburg, and we've got absolutely marvelous institution near us. It's a research institution uh, named by Petrov. Our institution is quite a young institution. It appeared in 2011, but nevertheless, it serves almost all the uh, half of all the citizens of uh, St. Petersburg. It's about 2.5 million people. So it's not the best audience to describe the actuality of uh, incidence of oncology. And we know that in St. Petersburg is higher than average all over Russia. And it's more than 20,000 cases registered every year and more than 13,000 uh, uh, deaths every year. Both males and females are uh, affected. It's not the disease that picks as for the Onco Center, it's 577 beds, it's uh, 79 surgical departments, it's operational block for 14 operational theaters, inpatient departments for 23,000 patients. Here we can see the pictures of possible uh, surgical intervention for our patients. We need to say that almost all tissues and organs can be operated in our department. So here you can see the total amount of operations. So more than 13,000 surgical operations were analyzed. What is epidemiological surveillance? I will try to tell about it in brief. So for nurses, it's a little bit complicated to understand because you think that you do not uh, participate in it, but it's not completely uh, like that. So that's the measure that uh, needs collecting and interpretation of data, including uh, intra-hospital infections and surgical intervention infections. The next step is informing the specialist, planning the measures and assessment of their efficiency. Of course, most of the actions are carried out by the epidemiological service, and sometimes it's with uh, medical workers and research workers. So the goal of epidemiological surveillance is in improving the quality of medical service by preventing the risks of infections and also prevention of risks of epidemi uh, um, pandemics and epidemics. It was mentioned in the reports by Galina Gennadievna. It was very, it had very interesting data. So we need to take into consideration that the system itself is not a goal to punish. So that means that when we register the infection, it doesn't mean that we punish the personnel that took participation in the measures. As for the goals, first of all, we need to identify the frequency of the infections connected with the medical service, because all our further measures are absolutely uh, useless if you don't understand the amount of infections. So we won't understand the effectiveness of our measurements and if they are the correct ones. So it's very important to compare the data with the uh, data from the literature we're talking about today. We know that in the Russian Federation, we've got some special uh, system of registration. 
that usually is in hiding the data. I'm not going to discuss it in detail. It's not the reason uh, for discussing today, but just take it as is. And in this situation, it's especially important to pay attention to the fact that inside every institution, we need to work out the system that will allow to assess really assess, actually assess the process and how harmful it can be and what we need to do with that. As for the legal basis, we've got enough documents to do that. And together with federal documents, we've got a very important document that is called the Order of the Health uh, Ministry of St. Petersburg. It registers the monitoring of spreading antibiotic resistant agents. Actually, St. Petersburg is, is a unique city because it's the only city where we are on this white level. We monitor monthly all the cultures that can uh, of polyresistant agents. The algorithm of epidemiological surveillance can be here, can be seen here. We're not going to discuss in details, but as for the terms to uh, conduct uh, this work should be discussed. First of all, we need to understand that we have to, uh, we, we need to have some special, uh, some special standards, what case is uh, registered and what case should not be registered. We also need to understand the method. If it's a passive registration, we just get the data they want to inform us about, or we use the active surveillance using the analysis of medical history and other ways and methods. It's mandatory to correctly calculate the indicators, the parameters. So that means we need not only to collect the parameters of frequency, but also uh, the, the parameter what we need to calculate it with. So for example, uh, we need to outline the patients we need to calculate it within. It's very important to have microbiological my, uh, monitoring in the institution because if you don't have the laboratory, it's impossible to understand what infection it is. And of course, the support from the administration because this work should be visible. Everyone should understand their responsibilities and what we do it for. As for the standard uh, determination of the cases, it's quite easy right now because we have some sanitary rules uh, that identify the standard cases. We don't need to make up anything, uh, so al any, any algorithm stops or something. If you need to enlarge it, it's possible, but that is the standard that defines the case to be infectious. So the groups of infectious that are analyzed, they are written here. I'm sure that you're quite aware of what those abbreviations mean. It's not only the surgical infections, but also uh, the uh, airway, uh, the renal, the cardiovascular infections, and also the infections of bones and joints, the prosthesis, and uh, post uh, catheterized infections. So those are the infections that must be registered and monitored. So the monitoring can be total, uh, continuous. You can combine active and passive um, identifying of the infections. So what we do uh, in our institution, we've got different sources and you can see them here. So every morning, uh, every morning we start with uh, examining uh, the severest patients. Uh, most of them, of course, turn out uh, to be in ICU due to the infectious complication, but it's only the top of the iceberg. So if we stop, uh, if, if we uh, just seize with the ICU, we will lose a lot of information. We need to have data from surgical department. 
about emergency operations for the patients in the inpatient department because it gives us the understanding why the patient was uh, once again operated. So usually uh, about 50 percent those are bleeding, but uh, the other reasons are infectious that need secondary uh, surgical operation. So the results of laboratory. We've got online regime, so taking into consideration that everyone has uh, cell phones now uh, with Viber and WhatsApp, almost all the cultures are autom automatically are sent to epidemiologist and clinical pharmacologist, and those two specialists can monitor the culture of any polyresistant stain. It's not about all the microbes, but the microbes from the sterile areas of the body or the areas that are potentially resistant, they become quite well known for the epidemiologists. Usually those are reports about the risk. I'll show you later the forms how we do that. Also the documented uh, symptoms of infection. It's quite usual, uh, useful in the beginning. The vision of uh, the actions of the medical worker, because this dialogue gives us information about some problem that should be solved immediately. Of course, very informative results are the, res uh, the results of forensic patients, because uh, those are results of cell analysis and uh, we understand everything. Documented reports of surgical interventions, it's filled by the surgeon. So it's the outcome of this or that surgical intervention. And of course, clinical pharmacologist who informs the epidemiologist about all antibiotics and uh, changes in courses of antibacterial therapy. So there are very many sources we need to work with in our head as uh, the epidemiologist to understand what is going on in the patient uh, department. And of course, without nurses, it's impossible to deal with that. So I tried to group out everything on this slide. So the red color shows the duty of the nurses. And you see that that much important information can be given by the activity of nurses of those nine surgical departments and ICU. So I will show you the chart of dressing nurse. It's filled daily. Uh, for each patient, we point out so the number uh, the c clarity of the wound manipulations and also you put pluses in the uh, places where that can be the signs of infection complica complications. No one makes the nurse to have the diagnosis, but that's the information that helps the epidemiologist to identify if there is some infection in the department or special prognosis for individual patients in his post-operative period. That's what <coughs> the report the monthly report looks for ICU that is also provided for epidemiologists to calculate the parameters for infections, not only the amount of patients, but also the amount of patients having different invasive manipulations, artificial lung ventilation, catheterization, and also the amount of hours of these manipulations, because the correct calculation is only possible uh, with presence of information not only about the presence of patients, but also the time of procedures. And that's the look of the doctor's chart. So it's a little bit simplified appearance. So each doctor has to fill in this chart. 
and points out if the patient had a fen infection or not. Now we have the electronic uh, option now and you can see on the right my desk. It used to be uh, folders where I had to collect the information and analyze it. Now we integrated all those informational flows into our generator of reports and I can see it on the screen and it's combined information that helps me to get orientated what is going on in our inpatient hospital every day. So as for our results, I show you some of them. So that's the frequency of infections connected with the medical service for the last two years. So our epidemiological service, as it exists now, was created only in 2016. So those are very fresh data taken into consideration that it's a young uh, institution is quite good. So per 100 operations, I didn't want to point out the name of uh, the department. It's not an annual report. And I don't want to say that uh, the departments with high columns are bad and with low columns are uh, good, but actually those are risk factors in each department and depending on that, the frequency of complications is different. But this analysis allows us to identify the risk departments and concentrate on them, understanding that those patients and those departments give us the main problems to be solved. And I haven't mentioned that last year uh, the uh, parameters were a little bit lower, but we didn't uh, get us frightened. It's registrational growth because introduction of those technologies and identifying infections with nurses allows us to identify those slight infections that rarely get to ICU, but they make this epidemiological layer in the department that uh, develop the risk zones that can lead to those flashes. So you don't need to pay attention to this increased level of incidency because on the background of that information, the uh, mor uh, mortality went down. So the amount uh, of patients went down to uh, 32 percent. And a few words about my... Well, we have the increase in the absolute number of samples. Our patients are examined more frequently. We received more samples, uh, more opportunity to analyze the resistance of our microflora. Here we see the resistance level of Staphylococcus aureus <laughs> on the left slide. Uh, the resistance is higher. Uh, it's how the resistance of Escherichia coli looks like. Uh, not favorable situation. It's sensitive only to meropenem uh, phosphomystin as to uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a difficult microorganism. The majority of antibiotics, more than 50, 60, 70 percent of resistance. Klebsiella pneumonia. Much has been said about this. It's a very dangerous microbe. It's a conditionally pathogenic uh, flora of uh, the intestines. It's very resistant, virulent, and pathogenic. Uh, we are trying to find against this Klebsiella high level of resistance, sensitivity only to cholestine. Despite the fact uh, that it's not easy to handle microbes. When we look at the level of uh, 
resistance to meropin and of Klebsiella. It turned out uh, that resistance dropped down. Despite the growth in infection, microbes, uh, they don't become more aggressive. It speaks about the fact that we are moving in the right direction while uh, ensuring control. The same is true for Acinetobacter. Last year, we have a great number of uh, cultures. Uh, they were resistant to meropenem and imipenem. Now the number dropped down. It's a very sufficient results. It's not a futile coincidence. It's uh, the result of the work of uh, the team of our hospital, uh, working diligently, uh, controlling and reducing the number of infections, improving safety and quality of uh, medical care. Thank you for your attention.